Alrighty. Um, before we begin um, today's talk, it's important to acknowledge the land upon which Cal State, Uni um, Cal State University San Bernardino is built. We recognize that Cal State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefit and benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institu institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples everywhere. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the Asian community here on campus. Yesterday's horrific shooting as a result of the white supremacy that exists in this nation is unacceptable. We stand in solidarity with those mourning, hurting, and want to uplift those who are with us today and all over campus. Um, now for our good news of the week um, that I was that I had found was that there has been two men arrested in correlation with the insurrection that occurred on January 6, 2021. Um, Julian L. Cater, um, 32, and George Pierre Chianos um, have been arrested in connection with the insurrection and have been uh, charged with assault in connection with assaulting a police officer. Um, I want to introduce today's guests. Um, give me one second. I'm so sorry. Ron Wilkins and Danny Widener. Um, Ron Wilkins has been a force in the struggle for the liberation of Black people for more than 50 years. A former member of Slauson Village, Wilkins led the first police monitoring project in California, the Community Alert Patrol. As a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Wilkins was a target of extensive police harassment and surveillance. Later, he was active in a variety of Pan-African causes, including support for the revolutions in Grenada and Zimbabwe during the 1980s. He played a critical role in solidarity work around South Africa and Nambia. He has conducted extensive research and political work around the themes of Black Brown unity and has produced an extensive photographic library on African people, both on the continent and throughout the diaspora. Danny Widener teaches history at UC San Diego. He is the author of Black Arts West, Culture and Struggle in, po in Post-War Los Angeles and the co-editor of Another University is Possible. His past current political affiliations includes the, excuse me if I mess this up, Vince Ramos Brigade, Community in Support of Gang Truce and the National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights, the Labor Community Strategy Center, Bus Riders Union, and the Pillars of the Community. Um, we would just want to remind you that our um, we have a section open for questions. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to today's guests and we'll get right into it. Thank you guys so much for joining us. And uh, we're open to questions whenever you guys are ready. Uh, thank you, Zora Lynn. And uh, I want to thank you for a very generous introduction. Um, and I want to uh, thank the university and everyone who helped make the event uh, possible. Our talk today, our discussion is about community responses to police violence, um, and in particular, what uh, our own forms of self-organization can contribute to our resistance to police violence and terror. Uh, so although we have like a little bit of a long ongoing talk, um, I do want people to understand that the, the goal and the subject of it is for us to think of ourselves as subjects in our own history as protagonists and not as people who are only acted upon um, by those in power or those with authority. Um, before I begin, and I'm gonna put some uh, images up in the background and then um, Ron and I will talk through them a little bit. I just wanna um, say that it's always a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to talk with Ron. Uh, I always learn a great deal. and I have a lot of admiration for him as a person who has spent really uh, a lifetime in our struggle. Ron and I began to work politically together in the 1990s around black and brown issues. I'm from Venice Beach originally. And Venice is one of the rare, or at one point was rare in the amount of tension that existed between the black and brown community, tension that was very much stoked by uh, police activity and police infiltration. Uh, and we went to Mexico together and we did a number of things. and. Uh, that was my entry point into learning about his own political um, history. So I'm glad to have an opportunity um, to share just a little bit. The story that we have today really starts in 1965, although you'll see we may go a little bit um, further back in time. 
And essentially, we're going to begin with talking about the 1965 rebellion. And the reason that we want to start here is uh, there's a variety of reasons, but the most important one is that for those of us who teach about the 1960s, 1965 is often used as a dividing point. It's a year that we use to talk about the shift from so-called civil rights activity to black power activity. It's the year that the United States began to first directly deploy soldiers into in large numbers in Vietnam to mark the internationalization of that conflict. And although it's never, you know, you always lose something when you pick a year or a time or a moment, um, it's a helpful transition point, I think, Ram will have um, his own thoughts as well, about thinking about a shift from, uh, I guess, the struggle to be brought into the United States as it existed to the struggle to transform the United States into something different. Um, and so we wanted to begin with 1965 and with the rebellion um, and I hope, Ron, that that's cool. And maybe you can talk us a little bit through specifically um, that August day, how you came to hear and find out uh, that something was jumping off and just kind of walk us through how, how that day unfolded for you and, and subsequent days as well. Okay, Danny, thanks. You've said a lot. Uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, thanks to the university. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. To have been invited. Um, as Danny has pointed out, uh, 1965 was, uh, was very important. Uh, it's very important for me as a young person. I lived at 633 East Imperial Highway, just east of Avalon, uh, there on Imperial Highway. Imperial Highway was a major artery for traffic, vehicular traffic uh, from way to the east, uh, all the way out to the west end uh, in the area of LAX airport and uh, so on. Uh, it, it so happened, I learned of the rebellion because I was sitting at home and from my kitchen window, I could hear a lot of commotion on the street. And I went out uh, and went just about a block and a half to uh, 115th and then 116th also in Avalon where a crowd had developed, people were very angry. And that's where I learned that Marquette and Ronald Fry had been arrested. Um, Marquette had been pursued by the highway patrol um, from further south on Avalon in a northward direction toward where he lived. I knew Marquette, uh, he was from a different neighborhood than, than I was from. I was from Slauson Village, as has been indicated. Uh, he was a D'Artagnan from an area known as Watts. We were clubs, we were neighborhood organizations. We often had conflict, but I happened to have not been in conflict with Marquette Fry, and I knew him. And uh, what the crowd was angry about is that the, not only the, Fry had been, the Fryers had been arrested, but also their mother, Rena Fry, would come uh, to claim the car once Marquette had been arrested. And the reason thing, the tensions really uh, spiraled up is because the car was impounded um, and people were saying, you know, if the car was not drunk, if Marquette was drunk, that's one thing, take him to jail, but, uh, but what, why are you impounding the car? And of course it costs a considerable amount of money for people without much in the way of resources to have to go and reclaim their car. And so that's what, kicked off uh, as, as darkness drew near. Um, we eventually confronted large numbers of LAPD who called for reinforcements among the Highway Patrol, Sheriff's Department, and other municipalities. I looked, one of the images that you, you will see, I think they're on the screen, has me, that's me there with my arms out. I was, had a big smile on my face. And I was facing these white LAPD officers and I told them, I said, you're just a white gang with badges, but we're gonna whoop you and run you out of here tonight. And we did. And we went on for some six days and nights and eventually they brought, brought in the, the National Guard and we said, you're cheating now, but uh, eventually it ended. But that rebellion was the cauldron that forged me into a community, made me become a community defender, a community builder, and a revolutionary activist. 
uh, for the rest of my life and I've carried on ever since. Uh, but anyway, that's the scene. Uh, the, 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 you see men around me holding up fingers. Three fingers were for Watts. G was for gladiators. B were for businessmen. V was for Slauson Village. And I would turn to them and say, it's not about what neighborhood we're representing. It's about us against these invaders, these intruders, these terrorists that have come into our neighborhood and we have to whip them and run them out of here tonight. But that was a, a thing with the rebellion. I should also say that Leon Posey, who was considered one of the first to be killed during the Watch Rebellion, was gunned down at eight by police who were, had barricaded themselves behind their cars in the middle of Broadway near 88th. And we thought for a while they were shooting in the air. But Leon Posey, a young man who was said to have been the first casualty of, this, of 39 or more victims during the rebellion, um, was shot down. I, he was standing just a few feet from me and he fell over back with his knee, back, back with his knees never bent. And I said, oh, they're actually shooting at us. And that's when things of course, continued to build, and we we were we we took the fight even more seriously. Let me ask something yes. about that run, if I might. I'm sorry to um, to mm -hmm. cut over you. You know, one of the things that happens when we see uh, community uprisings and rebellions of this sort, mm -hmm. the language, the media language, almost always turns to this discussion of people destroying their own neighborhoods or burning their own neighborhoods, and um, you know, these, these uh, uprisings are always cast as a negative, um, you know, activity. For one thing, they're called riots, right? And they're discussed right. as though they're completely disorganized. So maybe just for, you know, I know we have about 120 people on the, um, you know, in the forum. And I think probably, I don't know, besides for you, me, maybe two or three other people, probably not too many people here who've been in an uprising before. So can you say something to people, I guess, both about why the language that is used is important and why that idea of us as destroying our own neighborhoods is really a false way to talk about these? Um, yeah, yes, absolutely. The language is very important because when we call it a riot, we demean uh, and disavow those who, whose lives were forfeited during the uh, during the engagement, during the uprising. You have, we call it an uprising or a rebellion because we had, we were in resistance to um, uh, an established government and its rulers that were oppressing us. We had grievances. That's what makes it an uprising or a rebellion. A riot simply is when people just decide they're going to break the law and they're going, they're going to take on the police or whatever, but they, they, it doesn't have the same meaning. And so it's very important to not call it a riot. We demean those who's, who lost their lives, many of whom were shot in the back, many of whom were shot when they were surrendering to police or shot because they didn't obey a sign that said you can only turn right at this intersection and that sort of thing. Um, I should also point out that in one, situ in one situation, I want to mention Joe Nelson Bridget. He's recorded as the 22nd to die during the uprising. He was uh, only 22 years old. He came from our neighborhood, Slauson. He was gunned down after he actually had wounded two deputy sheriffs at Miramani in Florence. And when he came out of the store where he was holed up, they literally cut him in half with a shotgun blast. But he is one of the most, uh, he went out uh, in a way that uh, uh, we celebrate every year. We, we, when we recall the rebellion, we acknowledge Joe Nelson Bridget for his bravery and uh, his particular actions. I did want to say- Don't back away from that, yes. I did want to say, uh, because when you, you spoke of, uh, you know, acknowledging and remembering the rebellion that, um, you know, the rebellion in, in August of 65 became maybe you want to speak to this, but it became something that was actually acknowledged and commemorated inside uh, the California prisons and penitentiaries. And from there, I know that some organizations and groups continued to celebrate it and it became this kind of Black August celebration. 
that I learned about in Cuba. I was in Cuba one year and they were asking me about Black August and I said, well, I don't know what that is. And then they said, well, you should, it's from, you know, from where you are from. So just again, to, for people to understand that that's, that um, uprising of 65 had a long lasting effect on the consciousness and the activity of, of you know, millions of people in many ways. Yes, and that event, that rebellion, that six days, six day uprising, it was an effort on our parts to punish, to drive out, to destroy merchants that had been exploiting our people, uh, charging too much for goods, not hiring our people, and also against the police who had terrorized, who had been terrorizing us for generations. And word went out around the world. We saw the newspaper headlines in Europe throughout the African continent and other parts of the world about the uprising. And we were pleased, we were, we were really pleased that, that, that word had got out and that we had sent a clear message to the establishment to those in power that uh, we were fed up with our treatment. Mm -hmm. So from there, just to kind of segue, logical segue, um, you know, of the many organizations that came out in the years that followed the rebellion and in the um, the political growth of the community. One of the organizations that emerged was Community Alert Patrol. There's a guy who's real dressed up here in these pictures with this automobile. I don't know if you know him, can comment on him. But um, maybe you could talk a little bit about CAP, what CAP was, how CAP saw its role, um, some of the processes, challenges, uh, you know, and activities. Um. Sure. Uh, CAP, Community Alert Patrol, uh, got organized in June of 1966. Uh, Leonard Deadweiler, who was 25 or 26 years old, he was taking his pregnant wife, Barbara Deadweiler, way across town uh, because they, were, they felt that she was about to deliver. He was speeding and running through some lights. He had tied a white bandana on his car antenna to let people know he was in distress. LAPD, of course, noticed him and they began to pursue him. They made it a hot pursuit. Uh, they had a number of cars behind him. He finally stopped. And when he stopped, uh, a cop, I never forget his name, his name was Gerald Bova, went up to the window with his weapon drawn and he claimed because the uh, Leonard Deadweiler's car lunged forward, caused his weapon to discharge and he blew him away. And we concluded in the community that this was one racist traffic stop too many. Um, I was a young hothead like so many others. And I came to meetings of an organization called the Temporary Alliance of Local Organizations. And from there, the Community Alert Patrol was formed. We lasted for about a year. We went on for about a year. We were the first in the country to actually police the police. And yes, that's me in the photograph. Uh, got on a, we used to dress. I got, we come out of the streets. I had Stetson hat on, Stacy Adams shoes. Uh, that's a 1938 Plymouth because we came out of community organizations that really valued uh, older cars. Uh, we call these hoopties. And so did the Chicanos, they call them hoopties too. Uh, you see the white flag on my antenna. And uh, whenever police would stop black people, we would pull up behind them. We would get out with our cameras. We would photograph them, especially if they were doing something wrong. We stood uh, no closer than 10 feet. Um, and uh, we made sure that they didn't beat or mishandle the people that they stopped. And the community was very pleased with that. You see the phone number there on the side of the car on the sign. They didn't even have area codes then. That was who you know, that was way back. And of course, LAPD has on their cars to protect and to serve. We put to protect and observe. We're gonna protect our community and observe you. And that's precisely what we did. They hated me. It's interesting because, uh, <laughs> Uh, my homies uh, nicknamed me Crook. And back then we would call each other brother or sister because of our consciousness. And it's interesting that I had been living, I've actually just been back here in the US for several years now. I had lived in Central America for 
almost nine years. And about five years ago, I came back here to LA for a community event. I was there in the Merck Park in the Crenshaw area. And uh, a black guy, an older black guy, kept staring at me. He was sitting behind me and I looked around and he looked at me and he had a real excited look on his face. And he said, are you Brother Crook? And I said, looked at him and I said, yes, I'm the one they called Crook. I said, who are you? He said, I'm so-and-so, so-and-so, and I'm retired. I'm a retired LAPD officer. And I used to work 77th precinct. I said, yeah, that's the one we call Little Mississippi. He said, yeah, that's right. He said, I just got to tell you this. I said, what is that? He said, we used to report to work in the assembly room there in the squad room. And on the wall, they had a big photograph of you in that car that you drove. And they used to tell us that whenever we, to be on the lookout for you and whenever we saw you, to give you hell. And I said, is that right? He said, yeah, that's right. I said, you know what? I'm so happy you're telling me this because I knew it then, but I never heard it come from the mouths of one of you. And so it's interesting because this is, look, we're talking about close to 50 years earlier. This guy remembers me. You hear, you got black cops who hated me, who beat me, just as white cops beat me on the street. And we can have that discussion at some point too, uh, because we were out trying to protect our community and keep an eye on them. Uh, but that's, uh, the patrol was really interesting. The, one of the good things about the Community Alert Patrol is it helped us cross neighborhood lines, guys who had been rivals, different parts of the city. We, we rode together. I, I rode with guys from Watts, guys from businessmen, gladiators, sloths, and we were all members of the patrol. And uh, we were all out now uh, defending and, and building the community. So yes. I wanted to ask about this one um, coming from that. This is a, a, a page from the movement, which was the uh, newspaper of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Mm -hmm. Covering here, um, you know, obviously it's a, a discussion of a ride along. And I just, um, I find it maybe useful, or important to dwell on for a second, because I think when younger folks learn about the movement, especially if they hear about SNCC, they hear about, um, you know, SNCC in the South. They learn maybe Ella Baker, they learn, you know, some of the folks, uh, Avery Pearl, maybe people who were involved, Diane Nash in the South, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily hear about the work that SNCC undertook in the West um, or in other urban contexts or with other organizations. And I wonder if you want to just maybe comment on how this particular article came to be or how um, you came to be involved in SNCC as an organizational home alongside the, the patrol and other um, groupings, I guess. Okay, this paper, the movement put out by SNCC was actually published by SNCC people in Northern California, San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and they, they were very excited about what we were doing and uh, they covered us. Um, I happened to be, uh, my mentor was James Foreman, the one that in SNCC we call, this is him here uh, with the, you know, he, he noticed that he's got, he's uh, locked arm in arm with uh, Martin Luther King, but unlike Dr. King who has on a suit, Foreman's got on a shirt and tie, but he also has on coveralls or overalls because he felt that, and people in SNCC felt that your involvement in the struggle should be a lifetime commitment. You take struggle to the grave. Uh, and this is not to put Martin Luther King down, but many of the people in SCLC and some of the other organizations, they, the movement activity for them was kind of a weekend event. They would do it on the weekend, the rest of the week they were gone. But SNCC people in the South made it clear that they were there with the people uh, to see things through, through to the end. Uh, in 1967, uh, I got involved with SNCC after, I, after the, the demise of the Community Alert Patrol because they had taken the path of black power. And that was a real turn on for me. And I helped organize the first LA SNCC chapter in 1968. In fact, Angela Davis, who many people know, uh, was based in San Diego. I met Angela in 1967 
at a demonstration there in San Diego and we had some good conversation and I persuaded her to relocate to LA for the, at the beginning of 1968 to help us form the first SNCC chapter. So that was, that's, that's been you know, all part of my history. I wanted to step back just a moment to Community Alert Patrol and say that one of the ways the police harassed us is that they wrote us traffic tickets for no reason. They wrote one brother in the patrol uh, a ticket uh, and claimed that he had a deliberately torn and mutilated driver's license. How could the police conclude that it was deliberately torn and mutilated? But he actually wrote that on a ticket and gave it, gave it to the brother. They got out one time in front of my car, my hoopty, and got down on the ground with the measuring tape and measured the bottom from the bottom of my license plate to the ground. It was 11 inches. And they wrote me a ticket saying that I was required by law to have the bottom of my license plate at least 12 inches from the ground. And I went to court. I used to go to court with a shoebox full of tickets with attorneys. They had a Wall Street court. We call it the, I call it the shoebox. They had a Wall Street court near downtown LA. And fortunately, the white judge who presided over the court was sympathetic to the patrol. And I used to come in with some one, sometimes two attorneys. And he would recess court. He would take us in the back room. He would tell me, he said, look, I'm going to fine you for these seven tickets here and the other eight or 10. I'm going to uh, send you to traffic school because I want you to keep your license because I want you to stay on the street. I think what you all are doing is really useful work. And so this was the, this was the attitude of some. Um, so we, but we had a very difficult time. I want to, I wanted to tell the Ooga Booga story. Can I try to tell it? Yeah, man, do it. One night, one day we had a patrol office on Catalina, uh, street, Catalina Avenue, just off Adams. Um, and we had, that was our base station. We had a huge antenna on the roof. And one day, uh, about a dozen of us guys were hanging out. Uh, in the office and just joking around. And I said to one of the guys, somehow, for some reason, I said, Uga Booga. And he looked at me and said, Uga do. And I said, Uga do do. And so we just kind of joked around a little bit more. And eventually we all went out to the areas that we were going to patrol for the rest of that day and on into the night. And so that night, I happened to be on Central Avenue traveling south. I was in Watts in my car and I had someone riding with me. And um, I used, I liked hot chocolate and it was kind of cold. And I told the brother with me, I said, look, let's, let's go to the stop. The stop was a little nightstand where you could get something to chew on or something to drink. It was right there on Central Avenue and Imperial Highway on the corner, it's not there anymore. But uh, then we had another car. The brother said, yeah, let's go there. We had another community alert patrol car in the vicinity. So we got it. We had two way radios, citizens band radios. They're very antique now, but truckers still use them because it lets you know what the weather is up ahead and whether or not there's a cop sitting on the highway or whatever. So uh, I have a citizen band radio in my vehicle now today. But anyway, we. Uh, we called another car, got in touch with them, and they said they wanted some hot chocolate. And so they got behind us and we're driving along, uh, going south on Central toward Imperial Highway. And after a while, they look in the mirror and we got two black and white LAPD cars behind us. And so we finally get to uh, Imperial and we pull to the side park. And as we get out of our vehicles, these white police jump out. They're all red faced. It. They've got uh, their pistols out and their hands are trembling and they're shouting and they say, you got them niggas, get up against the wall, put your hands up, don't look back, don't say a word. And so we do just that. We put our hands up and, and walk towards the wall, it's four of us. And they start uh, patting us down and taking our ID and running our ID for, for wants and warrants and uh, so one's got me there while he's patting me down. His partner's got one of the other brothers not far from me. And I look at him and this comes to mind. I said, ooga booga. And he looks at me and he says, ooh doo doo. And I said, ah da da. And the 
police say, shut up, stop making that noise. And we go on with this. And after a while, this cop, not very long after that, he says to the other one, he says, Joe, I think you better be very careful because I think this one just told that one to get his weapon, pull out his weapon. And so I'm doing all I can to keep from falling on the ground laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the cop gets a call back on his radio that says we have no wants and warrants. So he looks at me and he says, uh, you're all clean. We're going to let you go, but we don't want you to go back to the, those vehicles you're in until we've gotten in our cars and we're clear out of sight. And I give him a nod of approval. And he, they get in the cars and they take off, man. And I fall on the ground. One of the other <laughs> brothers fall. We laughing so hard, man. But this was the, this was treatment at the hands of LAPD. And I shouldn't, shouldn't fail to point out that on uh, several occasions they pulled me out of my car and just beat me, beat me on the street, took me to the police station, didn't charge me, beat me in the station. And uh, this is the stuff they got away with. So I was very clear about who the enemy was and who a gang, who a gang yeah. is. A, the dictionary says a gang is an organized group of criminals. That's the police. That's who the police are. The police are, are gangs. And we no, need to be I, clear about that. Yeah. I could say something about that because I agree uh, completely with you. You know, I worked, my first job was at West LA College. And uh, history there, as you know, is in, in there with something called administration of justice. And I shared an office with a guy, uh, you know, I won't mention his name. And uh, he had been a LAPD officer in the 60s and early 70s. And he had been in their um, special investigative squad. You know, he'd been mm -hmm. uh, infiltrated. And I asked him, I said, so, you know, what did you do, you know, in, in the 60s? How was that being a cop? I was real cool. I wasn't, you know, trying to provoke him or anything, just asking. And he said, oh, yeah, it was fun, man. I used to go to these protests and I could throw rocks at these guys from the academy and then the cops would attack the protests and it was a blast. And I said, you know, you didn't, I didn't, you didn't feel badly about that or anything. It never, you know, bothered you. And he says, well, one day I did do something that, that bugged me a little bit. Mm. And I said, what was that? He says, well, I was sitting in the station house and these guys from animal control came along and they said, get off your ass and come with us. And we spent the whole morning in the Santa Monica mountains collecting rattlesnakes. And mm. we spent the whole afternoon, they had a list of names and we went to these people's houses and you know, in old houses, the mail slot will be in your door. You know, you just lift mm -hmm. up. And he said, we would go and if they had a mail slot like that, we'd dump a snake through their mail slot. And if it wasn't one, we'd go around, see if a bathroom window or something was open. And he says, we did about eight or 10 houses like that. And he says, I always mm. felt bad about that. And I told my father-in-law that story, who's from Mississippi. And he looked at me and he said, oh yeah, that's a Southern trick. I haven't opened my mailbox with my hand in 25 years, you know? Mm -hmm. And so just to go ahead with what you're saying about these being criminals, we're talking about people taking dangerous animals, mm -hmm. putting them in the homes of people who are doing nothing illegal and nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to um, jump forward from um, James Foreman, Jim Foreman, Mm -hmm. to talk about another figure who, um, who you mentioned in passing to me at one point, uh, James Boggs, because as you were talking about, you know, Community Alert Patrol and uh, Slauson Village and other organizations drawing together and people beginning to work together um, in a kind of long-term organized and systematic way, I wanted to just touch for a couple minutes on how you think of what you think of when we talk about organization or organizations or what it, what, do you, what it means, I think, for you to talk about being an organizer or part of an organization. What is the, the importance of that or the meaning of that as a concept? I mean, I think that's fundamental. Organization, and then education, and then action. Uh, Kwame Ture, better known by many as Stokely Carmichael, who really popularized the slogan of Black Power. Uh, and I, I always think about him because we, we've lost so many. He's a great ancestor now. Uh, but he said that if we remember him most by this, that he call, called on our people to organize. He said organization is central to everything. It's very critical. James Boggs, I, I had the good fortune of meeting James Boggs and Grace Boggs, and they 
to have passed on. Boggs was, uh, I think, probably the greatest theoretician uh, when it, and a uh, person to articulate black power, the meaning of black power than anyone else in the movement. Uh, one of the, uh, he'd written, he wrote quite a bit, but he, uh, one of the pieces he wrote was called The Awesome Responsibilities of Revolutionary Leadership. And in it, he talks, he said, he defined, he laid out black power. He said there were, he said, when we talk about power, we're not talking about what just happened in this country where you got Tweedledee over Tweedledum. I know some people are gonna squint, gonna jump at that, but you know, the Demo it's the Democrats or the Republicans, neither of which have our interests really at the end of the day. They're all about this country dominating the world, no matter which party they come from, which side of the aisle they come from. Uh, the power in this country, the, the wealthy people, the billionaires are mostly white uh, who decide things. And uh, they intend to not only be in charge of this country, but to dominate and to rule the world for all time to come. That's why they've even put weapons in space. They have weapons on platforms that they can fire from out. That's, that's what this whole space thing is about. Trump was very much about it, but what's his name who's in there now is also still about it. They're not, they haven't moved, pushed it aside about putting weapons in space so they can actually uh, fire them at targets on the, on the earth and so on. But Boggs pointed out, Jim Boggs said there are four essential elements. If we're going to uh, run this country, because that's what we're talking about. You're not talking about being on the other side of the aisle. You're talking about running the country. And he said that you had to be about ceaseless ideological development. Ceaseless ideological development. Be very clear about where it is you're going, what you want. He said you also needed to be about, um, I'm trying to recall them all. Uh, I'm using, I'm putting a spin on some of it. Ruthless criticism, self-criticism, criticism. You had to be very hard on yourself first before you criticize and point out, criticize others and point out their shortcomings. You had to also, um, trying to remember the others. <laughs> uh, they're escaping me here at the moment. Let me, let me yeah. say something about the criticism, self-criticism um, just briefly then, because you know one of the things that we can talk about this uh, in the question and answer you know, with the audience if they choose, mm -hmm. but you know, like you, I had some experience in organizational frameworks where there was criticism and self-criticism, where the work that you did was subject to the um, scrutiny of other people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I have noticed, you know, working around younger people, people in their teens and early twenties is that the culture today is a culture where people very much do not like being criticized by other people. And they associate being criticized with somebody disliking them or not being their friend. And that's one of the biggest differences for me between now and the political moment where I was formed, because when people criticize me, I regard that when comrades criticize me, I regard that as a sign of respect. It mm -hmm. means that they saw enough in what I was doing to believe that it could be improved. Mm -hmm. And people catch feelings now for things that really prevent us from being able to move forward because everybody acts as though everything they do is perfect the first time around. And you can't develop and grow if that's how you come at the world. Mm -hmm. you know, so I just think that's, when you, when you mention that in terms of bogs, it's a really a point that has a direct usefulness today, I think, for people to, to, um, to touch up and think upon. We can come back to the other points okay, sure. um, if we like, but mm -hmm. following from this um, element you said in terms of, um, organization, education, and action. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about this um, report, which I understand you had a major hand in, which is from 1979. And it deals with, um, as people can see, policing in schools, an issue that is a, a critical issue even still today as we speak. My wife is on a call trying to um, moderate and change the UCPD's presence on our campuses. You know, we, we live in a world where the police and our schools have fused so 
centrally. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the context of this report, what you, what you guys did, how you came around to it. And then I have a couple of pages that I blew up that I wanted to ask follow-up questions about. Sure. This, is, this report, as you can see, racism, repression, and inefficiency in the deployment and practices of school security. Uh, they call them now school police uh, more directly. But I was the person that prepared this report for the commission. Um, of course, it's about 40 years old. And it's I, uh, <laughs> you should know it's, it's 50 pages long. Yes. I, um, what I did, we were tired of having, seeing our schools look like, uh, they, were, they, were, they looked like prisons. There was an interesting article that came out in a magazine called Psychology Today, June 1975. And the title of it is, It's Tough to Tell a High School from a Prison. And we drew a lot of comparisons between that article and what was going on in LA Unified School District, which is the second largest district in the country. We found, I, I compared nine high schools in the inner city, uh, schools like Fremont, Jordan, Jefferson, Manual Arts, and so on, with nine high schools in the Valley and in West LA, which were predominantly white. And I found that the, the high schools in the inner city all were class were, were closed campuses. Students were always on lockdown, bathrooms were locked, there were tardy sweeps, hall sweeps, um, so on. In the white areas, the schools where predominantly white students went, they were open campuses. One school didn't even have a fence. Um, students were free to come and go. And I physically went to all these campuses, I, when I would approach the campus uh, in, the, in the predominantly white schools, uh, no one stopped me, no one questioned me. Um, I took photographs, I went into school, went around, checked things out. I found that in a number of those schools, even the bells rang more softly as opposed to in the black schools. Those schools, all of the predominant schools in predominantly white areas, it's an interesting thing. They had a, one security agent in the schools predominantly, that were predominantly black. They had two or three armed security agents. They had all the gates locked. They, um, they and, the, and I used the school district security sections uh, crime data, and it showed that schools in the outlying areas that were predominantly white reported more burglaries, more uh, drug use, more sexual assaults and things like that. Uh, and they had a larger acreage, many of them, they will um, have larger, uh, they, they have more space, but yet they only had a single agent. All of the schools, as I said, in the inner city had two, three or more agents. The only elementary school in the entire school district was Manchester Elementary at the time, predominantly black, and it had an armed security agent. These were the contradictions. We went before the school board and laid this report out, and they were uh, they they pretended. To, I guess they they were they, had, they they were shocked. The media was there. The media got it. The media put questions to them. They could not respond to the questions. What they did do is they increased the security sections, the budget to hire more security agents and put more in the schools. And so. Uh, <laughs> This, this was an amazing time. And of course, as we've uh, uh, discussed and as we looked at this, it's only worsened over time. Right. Um, but this was, yes, this was the report. No, this is a critical point. And it reminds me of a story I haven't thought about in a long time. So I'll, I'll tell it and, you know, and then we, we'll move on and soon we'll wrap up and uh, mm -hmm. we'll take a Q&A from folks. Uh, but my father, for a time, before he went into the classroom, he was a counselor at uh, Locke. Which is okay. a school, you know, for those who don't know, it's a high school in Watts. Mm -hmm. My father is from Watts. And uh, he was talking to a kid who was a good student, a uh, young man, black man. And this child, this young student had, a, um, had been accepted to, I don't know if it was UCLA or USC, probably UCLA. And he was telling my dad that he wasn't going to be able to go to college because his father had killed his mother. 
and the dad was going to go away. The mom was passed. And so he was going to be responsible for his siblings. And he just didn't feel like he could go to school. He had to work. So my dad is trying to strategize with him, you know, options this kid might have, 17 years old. And a vice principal comes by and uh, calls my father out into the hallway and says, uh, what are you doing? And Mike says, uh, well, what are you talking about? He says, well, that young man in there, what do you, what, why are you doing that? And Mike says, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, what are you talking about? And he says, you're talking to that young man inside the school and he's wearing a hat. And my father was like, you, are you serious, man? This guy, you know, he says at that point, he says, I just could not deal with being a counselor anymore in the high schools. The high schools were such a BS atmosphere. It was so colonial. He said, I just, mm -hmm. I got to be, you know, at least where I could teach and talk to people rather than deal with this kind of um, madness. So one of the parts I, I just excerpted from the report um, that I found so um, pointed is, you know, where you say here that the, um, the school district and the administration and even the teachers will often say that what happens in the school reflects what's happening in the community and the schools can have little immediate effect on eliminating the deficiencies in the general society. But you say, the BEC believes that much of the student failure, boredom, alienation, and hostility that develops into you know, class cutting suspensions grows directly out of negative school environments and is not attributable to the general society. And I think that's such a poignant, simple, critical, beautiful way of putting it, that the problems in the schools are generated in the schools, you know, because in all these conversations we see, as soon as we say something is responsible for something, they shift it and it's like, well, no, the job is responsible for your school. The school is responsible for the healthcare and the healthcare, you know, it's just like you can never get a hold of a problem without them switching the conversation to a different direction and nobody has any accountability or responsibility um, as a result. So I just yep. wanted to draw on that. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, it's a yes. It's, it's failure-oriented instruction, and it's prison-like environments. That's what generates a lot of negative student behavior. And, uh, you know, it's, I wanted to point out, it's 1704 is when the first slave patrol was established in South Carolina. And what did slave patrols do? And what did plantation police do? They wore badges. They... They, they prevented uprisings on the part of the enslaved. They went and caught runaways. If you were out away from a plantation, they checked your papers to see if you had uh, approval from your to be out. They broke, they broke up meetings they inf because they were afraid that the enslaved were plotting against the owners, which the enslaved should have been doing. They, um, um, they, in, they enforced curfews. That's what plantation police that later moved on from South Carolina to North Carolina, to Georgia, to other Southern states and so on. That's what they did. What I would argue is that police culture, policing culture in the United States today is an outgrowth of those slave patrols and those plantation police, that these police do the same things. And what's interesting too is, what's interesting too, is that we have, um, and this is gonna knock some people over, you got black police, you got Latino police, the sheriff, the LA County Sheriff's Department, I understand half of the sheriffs are Latinos. I just wanna mention the last time I got stopped here in LA, I, and by the way, before I leave that point, uh, one of the demonstrations that took place not long ago in this area uh, had to do with a 25 year old Latino who was uh, face down on the pavement. He was a security uh, guard and he, his weapon was uh, away from him laying out there. And it was, he was shot five times through the back and killed. Andreas Guardado. Thank you, by a Latino sheriff. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain, how can we explain because some people would argue that to straighten the police out, you need to get more police of color or more sheriffs of color. 
The problem is when black police stopped us and they still do that today, they jump on us, they beat us down. They want to show out to impress their white handlers. It's, it's the mission of the, it's the, the, the mission of the organization is what we have to look at. It's not uh, whether the color of the agent is white or black or brown, you see. Yeah, that's Sheriff. I mean, this is, this is something people I think really should, should key in on because, um, you know, when I was coming up, the, the police uh, chief of Los Angeles was Daryl Gates. He was a white man. Mm -hmm. He had founded the first SWAT uh, team, which was mm -hmm. against the Black Liberation Movement. And in response to these protests against the police choking people to death, he said famously that the veins on Black people didn't open up as quickly as they did on normal people. Mm -hmm. And sure he was is. the symbol of racist, you know, violence. He'd talk about, you know, the hood is Vietnam, all this kind of stuff. But today, that figure is really Villanueva, the Latino sheriff. And yes. it's so cold because he even went back. And if you go to the East LA Sheriff Station, they got a big sign on there that says Fort Apache. Mm. And mm -hmm. they made him take it down and he put the thing back. So it goes all the way back, as you point out, to slavery, but also to the colonial attacks on the indigenous people here. You know, that mm -hmm. the mentality of these people is, you know, we're in this fort and we got to attack these hostile Indians, you know, that are all around us. And we began our talk, you know, obviously with the acknowledgement uh, that San Bernardino, like our campus, is on native land. And it's just so telling that these, you know, men of color are the ones who are fighting this kind of policing war against our communities, you know, right now, as you say. Yeah, just as Chief Parker did back, way back during the time of the Watch Rebellion, he called us monkeys in the zoo. Mm. All right, he, they used to recruit the white rookies that come into LAPD. They did a lot of recruitment across the South. There were signs up in the South, in Southern states, recruiting young whites to join the police force here. And so it's a real mess it uh, that we're in. And it's really about uh, moving the police out, getting the police out, defunding the police, period. So and, I wanna, oh, uh, sorry, man. No, 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 my, my bad. I, want, I was gonna um, you know, open us up to maybe some Q&A from the audience, but I did wanna just point out a couple of things that you know, um, were part of your and my you know, experience, obviously that people are still seeing and dealing with today. Um, so I just wanted to point out folks that, you know, this use of military technology by the police really mm -hmm. was invented in Southern California. We've always been on the, the forefront of that, um, as well as the kind of community-wide harassment. Ron spoke about the use of fines as a way to both generate revenue off of the, you know, incomes of black folks, but also as a mechanism for resisting our, uh, you know, making it so we can't participate. Um, and then, you know, the, the murder of people for, brutal murder of people for trivial uh, events. You know, people know, obviously, Breonna Taylor's story, hopefully, they've learned a little about Natasha Harlins. Um, but as far back as 1979, you know, Eula Love was killed for a $22 payment over a gas bill, you know, mm -hmm. shot in, in view of her children at her home, you know, so we're dealing with a long struggle, you know, and uh, one that obviously won't end overnight, um, but one that uh, is like you said, Ron, it's, it's something we're called to as a condition of our, our living and our being, you know, it's a, it's a struggle we take to the grave. Um, That's right. So I do want to open it up. I don't know if you want to make any um, other thoughts at present, or we should just go into the Q and A. Or no, we can go. We can go to the Q and A. We can go to the. Q &A. But I think it's important to understand that police organizations are criminal organizations. They just don't call them that. Just like they they call many of us in this out here in the streets who challenge the system, who criticize the system, they call us terrorists. Okay, that's because they control, they have control of the media, so they can label you the way they want to label you. 
but I'm saying these police are gangs. The police, their color, LAPD, their colors are blue. Their turf is the precinct, whichever precinct they operate out of. When they shoot us down on the streets, they high five one another. They do that. And one has to really understand that this is the way they operate. They're, they're criminal gangs and we have to call them criminals. And the sheriffs are open about it. You know, the sheriffs- Oh yes, with the, the gangs. They've got, they're wearing tattoos and they got all the, they got names and all of that. Yep. Yes. Yep. In fact, one time the sheriff stopped us, you know, uh, up in, we were up in Malibu and they had us all on the car and everything were slapping us around. And this sheriff, and I was about 15, 15, 16, maybe this sheriff says to me, he says, you look nervous. And I said, I'm not nervous. I'm afraid, you know? And he said, well, why are you afraid? I said, because the police are dangerous. And he said, oh no, we're not police. We're sheriffs. He says, I'm, and he says, here, we have a song. And they sang this little song called The Boys in Blue Are Number Two that they sing about the LAPD. He says, you guys sing the song for us and we'll let you go. Wow. Let me tell you something too quickly about LAPD. LAPD SWAT, their, their uh, symbol that they hold up is an eagle clutching thunderbolt. That happens to be a Nazi symbol. And they have on each side, on one side, they have 41, on the other side, they have 54. 41 is for 41st and Central when they attack the Panther headquarters in LA. And 54 is when they assaulted the, uh, the uh, what's the name, people? Uh, 54th and Compton was- uh, SLA. SLA, yes. And, and burned down the, the house and all that and killed all the people. Uh, but that's th those are their symbols. That's the SWAT symbol. They did gangs, and you got to understand that. The last time I was stopped was about two months ago. I was in I was leaving Santa Monica, going down Lincoln, and as soon as I crossed Venice, crossed into Venice, past the black and white unit, the guy pulls up, gets behind me. I wasn't doing anything. I got my seatbelt on, my tags are fine on my old car, right? And he pulls up behind me, puts on the siren puts on his lights first and then right away the siren, I wasn't trying to get away, I pull over and he gets out, he walks up to the vehicle and he tells me the reason I stopped you is because your tags are not up to date. And I said, my tags are up to date. And I said, the reason you stopped me is because I'm driving while black. And he said, I didn't understand what you said. I said, you, um, you heard and understood what I said. And while I'm telling this, of course I got my hands up on the steering wheel to make sure he sees my hands out there. But I let him know. And I told him at one point, I said, man, y'all need to cut this out. He said, cut out what? I said, man, it's all over the news. You stop black people <laughs> more than the white people. Even the, the, the police chief has said it. I mean, come on, man, don't you even look, don't you look at the news. You wanna get, I can get a supervisor if you wanna challenge it. I said, no, I got something better to do. But I, I started to do that let him take me to the station, do the whole thing. Then I told him at one point, I said, you know what? Because he said his name when he came to the car, he said, my name is Officer Gonzalez. I said, hey, man. I said, listen. I said, you, uh, you say you're Officer Gonzalez? You're, a, you're a, a, a Latino and I'm an African. We're both men of color. Can't you figure it out? I said, man, what you stopping me for, man? And he looked so damn puzzled. You know, it was so funny. But anyway, I said, give me my papers back. Let me go. I got my license and my registration and went on. But that was the last time they stopped me. But he did not, he swore he didn't understand me when I said, you stopped me because I'm driving while black. Nothing wrong with my license plate, man. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. So um, with that, I think maybe, um... Zorlin or um, Stan, I don't know if you want to yeah, yeah. Uh, comment Ron, your thoughts. Yeah, mm -hmm. Ron, I just want to say thank you for the format. I like the format. you bouncing off of each other. That's that's really good. Thank you. Uh, and Ron, I'm glad you're still with us, brother, because I know yeah. you're stuck. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't expect to live to be 20, man. I'm surprised I'm, I'm still here. My, my yeah. age was 30. If I made it 30, I'd be happy. And I, I got okay. past this, so we're lucky to be here. Could you uh, expound a little bit on... Um, the original gangsters, uh, Chief Parker and Mayor Sam Yorty. Huh. 
Well, it was, I'll say this, when Parker and Yorty were in office, that's when we hit the 65 rebellion took place, it was easier to get people into the streets because the, the symbols of power were white. 92 was a bit tougher, but it still happened uh, because you had Bradley in office. By the way, Bradley and my mother come from the same home hometown, Calvert, Texas. And my mother, when she went to the colored school, she uh, they used to come to her classroom, take her out of class to the cotton field to chop cotton. And that's one of the reasons why I struggled so hard. Bradley came from the same town, grew up as a sharecropper, got, came here, got to be a cop, and then the mayor. And when he'd go back to Calvert, which is a poor, uh, racially segregated town, he would always stay with the white people. But I know that because I still got relatives there that used to tell me about when he'd come back. Uh, so, but yeah, with, uh, it was, that struggle was harder in 92, the uprising in LA, what I was trying to say. But you had, for the first time, you had more Latinos die and be taken to uh, prison than you had black people. And so it showed the solidarity with, among groups. Um, but yeah, it was it was uh, it was, a, I won't say an easier struggle. It was still a very tough struggle, with uh, with Yorty and Parker, but we we struggled nonetheless. And in '65, we uh, we certainly made a mark, fighting. I saw police scream and run and beg for their lives uh, when we attacked them with our fists and with rocks and bottles because. There were very few in the arms, you know, we were attacking them with our fists. And um, anyway. And then that's a great segue for my next question, because I, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you during the first, uh, it was seven days, during the first uh, seven days, how much organization was there? In other words, um, you, there it was interesting. It was interesting because they, they had a term they used, I'm trying to remember the name. But 103rd, for example, 103rd Street had a lot of businesses. And so, oh, they called them Charcoal Alley. They, they would say, this is Charcoal Alley number one. And then Central Avenue and Vernon was, was like Charcoal Alley number two. And see, those, those are businessmen down there, their neighborhood, and some 20s and some other groups, that neighborhood. What you had was you had neighborhood um, competition. We would see in certain neighborhoods, the word would go out. We didn't have uh, what's the social media like people got now. The word would just go out that tomorrow we're going to go to this place, we're going to go to that place. And we're going to try to turn over and, and ignite. We're going to turn over and torch more cars than they did in the neighborhood over there. So it was almost it was almost neighborhood competition, but it was word it was a word of mouth thing, because you didn't you couldn't get on the phone and just text somebody and say this is what we're gonna do. I went to when I said I was next to uh, Leon Posey on 88th and Broadway. We had decided that the next day we were gonna go to Broadway and Manchester because there were a lot of businesses there, and we wanted to punish the 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 merchants and run them out. And in some cases, people wanted to torch the place and all that, and that's what happened. But that's how I happened to be there, to be standing next to Leon Posey. He had just walked out of a barbershop and had a haircut and had run his hand over his head, feeling good about the haircut when they when they shot him. He should have been, uh, fortunately, he should have, but he should have been paying more attention to what was going on on the street. So thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, I actually had a question. I was uh, listening to a podcast earlier today about the rebellion and everything because I just like wanted to learn a bit more about it. Um, and one of the things that they had introduced or discussed was Martin Luther King's take on it. And he had called the rebellion more of an environmental issue than it was a race issue. Um, he was saying an environment where black people are disenfranchised, education is limited, housing is restricted, and so on. I was going to ask if you guys would would agree, um, would you say that this rebellion was a result of people who were sick and tired being sick, being tired of this, of what was going on? That yes, it was like yes, yes. But in King, yes, go yes. ahead. 
And King also came to South LA. See, it wasn't, we call it the Watts Rebellion, but Watts is not quite three square miles. Many people don't know that. The curfew area where the curfew was imposed by the police and later joined by the National Guard was 54 square miles. It the was very of large in 65. So, so yeah, when King came, we put it out, put, put it out to the media that was around that we don't want King here. He needs to go back where he came from. Uh, what's his name? Dick Gregory came. You know, Dick Gregory got shot in the leg. Somebody hit him in the leg, uh, and he left. But he came. He was trying to get people to come. We said, no, we don't want to hear that. We're here to tear this place up. Okay? And that's what we did. So, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I mean... I I can only I can answer only in the context of 92, but I can answer very similarly. You know, I remember very clearly the night that uh, they put the beating of Rodney King on the TV. And I went down. Uh, there's a big church on Western. And I went down to this church, Western and Adams, and um, there were a whole bunch of black politicians there. Some I'm not gonna mention too many names because I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to annoy Ron with some of these people's names. But uh, one person who is a you know a contemporary hero to a lot of people, she looked me and my friends dead in the face and she said, "Nobody has to do anything because this thing is on camera, and these guys are caught, and it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be all right." Basically, was the the, the message and. You know, when they let those police go, my feeling of it was the system has declared war openly on people. You know, I mean, this was not like, because years of harassment, but then, you know, like I was saying in the earlier piece, the feeling that you have when you see them pushed off the street after they've been pushing you around for your whole life, you never forget it. And it's the same feeling that you read when you hear people talking about, you know, fighting in Algeria or the Vietnamese seeing the French surrender or mm -hmm. the Cubans. You know, it's a it's an anti-colonial feeling. It's a feeling of pushing the occupier out. And that feeling doesn't leave you. You know, I think one of the things that's very difficult for people who came, and I was fortunate because even though the liberation of South Africa didn't go down the way we wanted and hoped, and it's an ongoing process, I lived through that struggle, which was a successful struggle. You know, even though the police came back, I did see them driven away once. I think for people who are under the age of 25, 30 years old, it's very difficult because if you don't have the experience of victory of some kind early in your political life, the enjoyment is absent and, it, and the struggle feels like a duty instead of um, a mission. And those are different feelings emotionally. And so one of the things I think that, um, I don't know how you produce this, you know, it's circumstantial, but I do think that when you start out from that position of feeling like this can happen, you know, change is gonna happen, it's inevitable. You just have a, more positive feeling about embracing a lifetime of struggle and politics, you know, than if it's all oh, got to go to one more demonstration, got to make another sign, got to, you know, experience the brutality. Um, so, yeah. You know, I wanted to say on the last day of the Watch Rebellion, I was walking uh, north on Avalon toward Imperial Highway and a, a, a troop <laughs> truck came by with uh, about maybe 30 to 40 National Guard members, heavily armed, sitting on the truck. And several of them uh, looked at me and, and uh, said, you know, made little sounds, letting me, putting, putting me down. Just a couple of them gave me the finger. And I turned, I gave everybody on the truck the finger and told, and told them, I said, get down off that truck. I'll whoop everybody on this truck. I felt so damn good. I was so, I don't know what was going through my mind. I said, get down off this truck. And a couple of them got up to get off the truck and somebody in charge told them to sit back down. And they sat back down. 
And after the truck left, I said, you fool. I said to myself, what you, what you doing? <laughs> but I called everybody on the damn truck. I said, get off the truck. I'll whoop everybody on this damn truck. That's how elevated mentally I was behind the, 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 the previous days. I just felt so good. that There were times we would be throwing stones and bottles at vehicles, white civilians going up and down Imperial Highway. And after the, after the vehicles would pass, I would walk to the other side and embrace the people. You had pregnant mothers, everybody throwing whatever they could put their hands on at the vehicles with white passerbys. In. And uh, I'd go over and I'd embrace them and apologize because I, I threw and missed the vehicle and I almost hit somebody on the other side who was on our side. And so these were the kind, this was a, a lot of it had to do a lot with the interaction. We chased some white men out of a truck uh, from Imperial Highway a couple of blocks down the street. And we were about to, we finally trapped them in this corner and some black women had run out on the porches of this apartment building, on the porch of the apartment building. And they said, what are you, what are you boys doing? What you attacking them men for? They haven't done nothing to you. And one of the dudes in the crowd, I won't call his name, who was from our neighborhood, he said, remember Emmett Till? Remember them four little girls in that church in Birmingham? And he said, you right, you right. And then they started saying, kill them, kill them, kill them. This is what the women started saying to us, kill them, kill them, kill them. After first trying to stop us. But you, people needed to be reminded in some cases as we have to remind people today of what all this hell we've been through, all this suffering that we've uh, endured. I totally, yes. I totally see what you're saying. And then just to go off of that, um, there's a question in our chat. Um, one of our attendees says, thank you for an enlightening, enlightening presentation and for your dedication these many decades. What, um, what were the critical flaws of the Black Power Movement and what advice do you offer Black Lives Matter today? Um, going off that, I also wanted to add a part of my question was as an, organizer, as an organizer, what is your message or call to action to young organizers today? Okay, I, I wanna say something. Uh, I think uh, a lot of what's going on that Black Lives Matter has uh, had a lot to do with, has been good. I have a, a central problem with them. And then I wanna come back to some of the weaknesses of the black power movement. I have a central problem with them. Uh, July coming up, July 8th will mark five years since a young black man who was ex-military uh, wrote a note saying that he was taking the action he was taking, taken because our people had been uh, he named different ones that had been killed by police up until that time. He was, re this was retaliation. This was in Dallas. Do you remember? It'll be five years in July. Uh, he got down, he took out five police. And uh, about a week later in Baton Rouge, a young black man did a similar thing, wrote a note saying this is in retaliation for what you've done, the people you've murdered. And he took out, he took down six police, three of them uh, checked out. Uh, Black Lives Matter denounced them. And um, I have a problem with that. Yeah, I have a problem with that. Because what's interesting is that after, I wasn't in the country at the time, but what's interesting is after that happened, after those young men took that action and said it was retaliation uh, in, the, in the period immediately following for some time, there was a noticeable decrease in the number of black men, especially killed by police across this country, uh, which goes back to something that someone once said, if you're gonna stop something, you need to, it needs to be an eye for an eye and a head for a head. And uh, that put, and it's interesting because it goes back when I was, I was uh, heading up the community alert patrol, we were having a press conference. I was with some of the, one of the lawyers and the media asked me, they said, well, you all are out at night looking for police who are doing wrongdoing. Suppose you see some black people doing some wrongdoing. Are you gonna report them to the police? And I looked at them and I said, we will never be snitches for no, for, uh, on our people. We never be snitches for no police. The lawyer said, I could have answered it more tactfully than that, but that's, the, that's what I said. And I'm very clear about that. 
the Black Lives Matter people denounced, not only did they say these Black men were not members of Black Lives Matter, they denounced them. And I think that was a, a major error. A couple of major errors, there's an interesting film out now called uh, The Judas Factor and The Black Messiah about Fred Hampton. I never met Chairman Fred. I think I spoke with him once on the phone. I met his widow, I met his son. I was on a picket line once with Bill Hampton, his brother. But Fred Hampton was a courageous panther. Uh, there were many courageous panthers, not just men, but women. Uh, I've known, I knew so many of them. I know all the leadership of the Panther Party. I knew Huey Newton, you know? I, uh, I knew Eldridge Cleaver, uh, Bobby Steele for a while in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We had an alliance with the Panther Party, but the Panthers had two, made two fatal errors. And in all the critiques that I've read and heard about this film, none of this comes out. The first is you can't be the Black Panther Party for self-defense. You can't be about self-defense when you're fighting a monolith like the United States. This is an empire with enormous resources. And if you know anything about conflict and, and warfare, I'm just being very straight up, you can't be a, you can't fight a, a war a self on, based on self-defense. You have to fight what's called the war of the flea. You have to be a guerrilla. You have to attack when the enemy's not expecting you to attack. You have to attack at night. You have to get hit him from behind. You have to fight this war of the flea. So a thousand fleas can take down an elephant over time. And that's something the Panther Party did not understand. And that's, not, that's something that doesn't come across in that film at all. And none of the critics of the film have said that, but I'm saying, and we used to say it in, in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee because we had an alliance with the Panther Party for a time and finally it went under. But we said, you can't be about self-defense and you're, you're fighting an empire. The other major weakness is what we call loose recruiting. When you decide, when you take the path to liberation in this country and say you want to eliminate oppression, and be about um, uh, self-determination, the enemy's gonna come at you with all they got and they're gonna infiltrate your group if you let them. I came from a neighborhood where if you ran up to us and said, let's go slap this cop over here, let's go bust the window out on this building, first thing we gonna do is look at you and say, well, who are you? Who can vouch for you? When, did, when have you stood and fought and not run from a battlefield? Um, you know, and if you can't, you know, it's interesting because in that film, Fred Hampton's, the guy, O'Neill, who became not only Fred Hampton's, Fred, drive, drove Fred everywhere he went, he became chief of security and he was the police. Come on, man. And so these are major errors. The other error I always fought the Panther Party with is they brought all the whites back into the community. With black power in 1966, we said all white people can do is get out of the community and write us a check. The Panthers turned around and headed by Eldridge Cleaver because Huey quickly went to jail after getting involved in a shootout and Bobby Seale was chairman, but he never ran the party. Anybody that knows the party knows that. Um, Eldridge ran the party. He invites all these white people back in. That's why today there are more films on the Black Panther. I'm, by the way, the Black Panther Party films, I'm in every film. One of the ones they did called uh, Vanguard of the Revolution, I'm probably in there about four or five times. I was at Bobby Hutton's funeral, 17 years old, the first casualty in the Panther Party. I'm standing on one side, Marlon Brando's on the other. They ID Marlon Brando, but they never identify me because there are many in the Panther Party who want to take credit for everything and not acknowledge others. I was there representing SNCC. I could give you a story, the, the, the black leather jackets, the Panthers, true enough, were the most colorful group to come out of the 60s with them black berets and black leather jackets. But they weren't the first ones to wear the black leather jackets. They came into existence in October 66. In 1963 or 64, some dudes from my neighborhood, from Slauson, went to Beverly Hills out on Sunset and drove a car through the plate glass window of Wilson's house of suede and leathers and took all the leather coats. And depending on your standing in the neighborhood, that's what coats you got. I ended up getting a couple of coats eventually uh, from guys, but I didn't have no, I wouldn't have the highest standing. So I didn't get 
like top of the line, like some the, the top shelf, like some guys. But we had leather coats. We were the ones that brought. We were about fashion, all right. But if you don't know, you don't know history, and can't nobody, nobody around telling you. You don't know this stuff. You think the Panthers did it all? People might not know this either, uh, Rob. But they can look. You can go on YouTube and you can look up the Sloss and Shuffle. <laughs> Sloss and Shuffle. That was the song. Yeah, we we had we invented dances. And by the way, let me say something about Slauson. We have annual reunions. We also have an annual dance. Reunion, reunion is usually August the first Saturday. We didn't do it this time because of this this pandemic. But we invite all dudes, the toughest dudes from all around LA and beyond LA who were rivals back in the day to the park. We all like the same music. We break bread together. We embrace one another. You know, we tease each other about how we used to ambush each other and all that kind of stuff. And Crips and Bloods can't do that, but we can do that. I knew Raymond Washington, who was the founder of the Crips. He lived up one block from me in the neighborhood, all right? But when you don't know no history, you just uh, believe what people tell you. And all these films are being made on the Panthers because we, we used to call them the darlings of the white left. The white folks love them because they brought the white folks back into the hood after we had run them out. That's why they all these films on the Panthers ain't no films about nobody else. So thanks for having me here. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, we'd like to get uh, Mary Texera in here to give her uh, wise words. Sure. Mary. I, I have a question, but I want to thank uh, Daniel and Ron for just, uh, first of all, walking me down memory lane. <laughs> I have not heard the term Wilson's House of Suede and Leather <laughs> in, in 30 years. And you know, that used to be hot. That used to be some hot stuff. And you just you just proved that it was even hotter than I thought it was because I hadn't heard that story. That's fantastic. Uh, I'm so impressed with um, you know, certainly Ron and Daniel to a certain extent. Um for ha having such an up attitude, knowing that, you know, you, you all talk about being stopped by the police as if it were just something that was a natural occurrence and you can laugh about it now. Um, and unfortunately on, you know, on the other hand, for me, it's a, a bit uh, bittersweet because uh, my two brothers did not survive uh, the streets of Watts and the streets Sorry, of LA. Um, I was, in fact, looking for them in all the pictures <laughs> that you all were showing um, because they were caught up uh, in the streets, just like uh, a lot of the young black men uh, uh, in the 60s and 70s. Um, but I, I just want to commend you guys so much for having survived those streets. And, and uh, there is just something, the other impressive thing is that you all know you're right. And this is so important for students to see. And, and Ron, your message of, uh, you know, know your history. Mm -hmm. And there's something about knowing that you're right where nothing can stop you. Even a, you know, a, a, tank, a, a tanker full of, or excuse me, a, a truck full of, uh, of, <laughs> of, of, of soldiers, National you know, Guard, I yeah. mean, where you can give them the finger, yeah. you know, because yeah. you know you're right. And it's something that you're willing to die for. And, mm -hmm. and it's hard to, um, you know, social media does not teach us history and our students are on social media a lot. I'm not putting it down, but it's not enough. You have to study, study, study mm -hmm. and, and, and thereby know your right, know your rights and know you are right. Uh, and nothing can stop you once you know you're right. And, and you know, you have lived, you, bo you have both lived for decades in this struggle and it doesn't sound like you're about to slow down at all. Not at all. So I, I do want to thank you. Uh, you have been very, very inspirational. You know, we've, we've had, we have over a hundred students listening to you now. And uh, we did, you know, some of them are having to go to other classes, mm -hmm. but, um, but they have been inspired. I know they've been inspired by you. Um, and, and I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart um, for, Thank for you. gracing us with your presence today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Yeah. 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 I really appreciate it as well. I, I do want to, I don't know how we are for time, but I know that um, Janelle has asked a couple of questions, one about justice in the schools and one about um, civilian oversight. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to hear people's thoughts on both of those questions. I don't know that I have answers to either 
Well, you guys, please feel free to answer answer the questions. You know, I know Ron touched on, um, you know, police in the schools, and we've had a couple of panels now addressing addressing uh, police in the schools, and we will in the future have uh, some folks from our union talking about um, getting uh, the police off of college campuses, UC, the UC and, and uh, CSU campuses. So we'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Thank you, thank you. You know, I just I just wanted to say too, one of the, before social media, when we used to organize, uh, Jim Foreman, my mentor in SNCC, he had a thing called the 10, 10, 10. What we'd do, and we didn't have cell phones, we'd have the phone there at the house. You'd, 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 you'd be given responsibility for calling 10 people. And each of those 10 people you had to tell that we're gonna meet on first in Vermont on Sunday at two to do such and such and such and make them accept responsibility for calling 10 other people. But that's how we organize. It's funny when you think about it now, all you gotta do is get on the phone and just hit a couple of buttons and, and there it is, you know, but we, we couldn't do that. And then we did circulars. I learned how to produce circulars or flyers that was a technique and artistic technique. I got a ton of, I got all my history that I'm, I'm putting together now for all these years. Uh, I used to, I did radio for a dozen years. I did a show on Pacifica Radio, uh, KPFK called Continent to Continent, an African issues magazine. And I used to interview gorillas in the bush who were fighting, you know. Uh, I remember I interviewed Peter Tosh who was with Bob Marley. Mm -hmm all this. And by the way, speaking of Marley, I loved Bob Marley and his work and his contribution. And you, you all have probably heard that an FBI agent not very long ago on his deathbed confessed that he was the one that took out Bob Marley. He went to Marley's home in Jamaica after Marley wasn't seeing anybody else because he had performed and he was tired and said he was media and got let into the house and gave Marley some gifts. And among the gifts were some tennis shoes that were some fancy tennis shoes. And he kept asking Marley while they were talking, uh, try on the shoes, see if you like them. They had put a needle with some uh, cancer in the needle, a very deadly cancer. And when Bob put on one of the shoes, put his foot in, he jumped, pulled his foot out real quick, said, wait a minute, because ah. you know the needle stuck him and the agent knew he had got him. But Bob Marley, I, I wanted to say that, but Marley, among all his, he put out one called Buffalo Soldiers. And the Buffalo Soldiers, we have to be critical of because after the Civil War, these black units were dispatched to the Plains area of the country in the Southwest, and they rounded up indigenous people, forced them on reservations. The last of the so-called Indian Wars was 1912 and 1913 in Arizona, and it was Buffalo soldiers holding weapons on indigenous people, uh, make, taking them captive. And so I say I'm very, I'm critical because we don't need Buffalo. We don't need black people on these police forces and sheriff's department, these sheriff's departments uh, abusing our people as the others do. You see, we have to be clear. It's not just about race. It's also very much about class, very much about class. I agree. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask um, if you could maybe just enlighten me or teach me because I really don't know too much um, about it. Um, just like the idea of policing the police, you were a young man and I believe you said you started this at between the ages of 17 and 20. Was that was I, I was uh, I was 19 in the Washington Bay and I was 20 with the patrol. Yeah, so I'm 20 years old right now, and I couldn't okay. imagine. More, and I could imagine doing something like that because you know we have to do it if we're going to change anything. It starts with you know in our communities. So may I ask you if you could just teach me a little bit of teach me something about how being that age, where did you get like obviously the heart of change is within you, but where how did you feel as such a young man like doing something so noble like that, like well, how did I that? Saw it, I told you doing the Watch Rebellion. Brother was he was standing just a few feet from me, and was shot down, for and he was doing nothing. All right, when I was a youngster with my three siblings, 
at the time, later four siblings. My mother was a single parent, but she grew up, we, as we grew up, when we were young, she told us how they, they used to take us to the cotton field to chop cotton out of her class. And so what I'm telling you is I'm driven. I've been driven. I don't have a choice. Plus, I value our ancestors. Um, some people are going to say I'm knocking it. I try to be very careful about how I talk because I don't want to tread on somebody's uh, beliefs. But uh, the, when you look, when you know your history, you look at African people and you go way back. The earliest form of spirituality that was widespread among African people is what people normally refer to as ancestor worship. And so it's our ancestors and our ancestors, your mother's mother's mother and your father's father's father struggled so that you could have a good life, struggled so that you would be free and not be oppressed or, or be abused. And so you're indebted to them. You, 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 you're born with responsibility. And you want, when you draw your last breath, and they're getting ready to put you in the ground. You want your mother's mother's mother, father's father's father to smile and say that we welcome her among us right now because she put in good work. She put in, she spent her life putting in good work. Because what, what are you living for? Some people are living, and I know somebody's gonna get upset. Some people are living to run around with their pants hanging as far off their butt as they can. That's what they do. I swear, I don't understand it. Some people are living because they want to get high. We used to say, if you're going to get high, get high jumping on the man. Get high fighting the enemy. That's your high. Fred, Fred Hampton, the real, real Fred. That's what Fred used to say. He used to say, I'm high off the people. You know, why are you going, you know, and I agree with, I don't want to go all over the place, but I, I agree with what, uh, what's his name used to say, Richard Pryor, that, that narcotic make you null and void. Now mm -hmm. they didn't legalize this stuff. Mm -hmm. And this, this the place, this, this country has gotten very strange. These drugs are, people just dart out in traffic because they own drugs. They sit at a light because they, they texting somebody. Oh, this country, this place has gotten very strange and very dangerous with a lot of the behavior that's going on. But yeah, you have to, I'm saying you have to, you have to be driven and you have to tap into your history and you have to uh, be responsible to your ancestors. That's what, that's, what, that's what should get you going. Could I add just one piece there too? Because Ron mentioned Stokely Carmichael. And Stokely Carmichael used to tell people as well, it doesn't so much matter what organization you join. It matters that you join an organization. Because part of the key is, you know, if you look through Ron's political history, Ron worked on Grenada. He worked on... Southern Africa, he worked on Black Brown. I went with to Oaxaca with him, you know, plus all the things we discussed today. It's a long history. You have to find people who you enjoy struggling with. They're not always your best friends, but they're people you can count on. And they're people who you look forward to seeing out there on the street. And when you find those people, then it doesn't become a chore. It becomes uh, a calling. You know, and so we don't always meet those people. You can't pick when you'll meet them. You have to put yourself out there. You have to go out. You have to go to demonstrations. You have to go to meetings. You have to, you know, you have to, I mean, it's hard now we're in a pandemic, but we got to get out of our rooms, you know? And I will say this, and this is something I think that hasn't been the case for a long time. If you look going back to the sixties, what a lot of people don't remember about the sixties is the president was a Democrat. It was Kennedy, then Johnson, that got us in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. The Senate and the House were controlled by Democrats. You know, Ron mentioned that they're the same, but it's also the case that the rebellions we talked about, they were rebellions from the left and from the people against the center. The situation we have now is much more like that mid 60s situation than any time of my life, right? The time I've been alive has been the Ronald Reagan thing the whole time. And that is maybe over, you know? So your generation, you guys have some opportunities that don't come around uh, every day, 
And I think your creativity and conviction is going to be a very big part of whether this country, you know, where this country goes. You know, I'll say one last thing, you know, about that, because I teach history for a living. And if you look, this country in the 1960s and 1970s, it had almost a civil war. And in the 1860s and 1870s, it had a civil war. And in the 1760s and 77, 1770s, it had a revolution, which was really a civil war. And in the 1660s, it had Bacon's Rebellion, which was a civil war. Civil war is baked into this country, and it even happens the same time in every century. So it's not too far away, and it's not too soon to start preparing for it, because the other side is preparing. You know, and I think it's incumbent on your generation to understand that each one of those civil wars has pushed us a little bit forward, but they're dangerous. And it's a hell of a thing that's coming down the tracks. And we have to be cognizant and ready because like I said, you see all these little militia groups, the cops, they're, they're thinking through what does it mean to fight for power? And we don't talk about taking power. We talk about everything else other than taking power, getting people to listen to us and this, that, and the other. The struggle is it's, it's for power at the end because either we're in control of our own lives or somebody else is in control of our lives. Those are the only two choices. Yeah. And can I, just, that, yeah. can I just add to, uh, for Zora Lynn, uh, your question, which is I think a question that burns in the hearts of a lot of young, passionate, folks like you, uh, there is no better place to organize than on a college campus. You're sitting in the middle of this richness. You know, we have Black Faculty Student and Staff Association. Um, we have uh, uh, the, the Student African American Sisterhood and Brotherhood, but you can start your own organization if you want. If you don't think they're radical enough, you know, start a, you know, a re revolutionary club. And there, there are that, not that many restrictions on club, uh, on clubs in, uh, uh, at the university. I mean, we got all kinds of clubs and you can certainly start one too with, and, and start recruiting like-minded people, get a, get a professor who is uh, your advisor or a staff who is your advisor and start your own organization. You know, I'm not talking about amassing weapons or anything like that, but I, but I am saying that, you know, you all can sit around and talk about ideas and implement those ideas on a college campus, right where we are. And listen, just my, one last, my last little two cents. Don't be afraid to go to jail. Mm. When you go to jail, that's just that's where I draw the line, Ron. Mean. Sorry, that's that's that. I, uh, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just. Okay. Like... <laughs> it's another opportunity to organize because you got a captive audience. Yeah, can't nobody yeah. leave. I used to keep the brothers up all night. They said, "Man, <laughs> would you shut up and get me a drunk?" I said, "Let me finish making this last point." So you got a captive audience. Also, get out of the four walls of them classrooms on them campuses. Travel the world. Go to go to Egypt. I went to Egypt. Go to Giza desert outside Cairo. They got the Valley of the Queens. They got all these bad sisters, warrior queens, many of them, laid to rest there. Feel that energy. That'll, that'll push you. Go to, I've been to Congo, which is the richest country in, on the African continent. I went there when Mobutu, the dictator, was being run out by the Kabila government, who was a Lumumba's. I went to Patrice Lumumba's home. There was shooting still going on, and we still went there, and we still sat down, we taped him. I went to Libya. I went to Libya twice, even though there was a travel ban. Reagan said, you can't go to Libya because it's a terrorist nation. I said, that's my ancestral homeland. You can't tell me that I can't go home. Who the hell you think you are? I was in Gaddafi's tent each time. When you make a call in East Africa to anyone in West Africa, the call has to bounce off a European satellite. They control the call. They make the money. Gaddafi was going to put up a satellite for African people. He had great love for sub-Saharan dark Africans. They were the people who were given jobs in Libya by the thousands. They were locked up with these people who took over after this witch Hillary and, uh, and Obama and led the invasion and they killed Gaddafi, sodomized him with a bayonet. You gotta know the history. Took those same, he loved black Africans. Took black Africans and run them out of the country, killed some, 
took some to the Tripoli Zoo and put them in the gorilla cages. This is the news you don't get here. But when you part of the movement, you, you learn this stuff. If you ask people today, how did Nelson Mandela get out of prison? He got out of prison because of a man that Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael says the blackest man in the, was the blackest man in the Caribbean. That was Fidel Castro. The Cubans under Castro, 300,000 Cubans went to Angola in the late 1980s, defeated the racist South African invasion force. And South Africans to look good at the bargaining table agreed to Namibia's independence, black majority rule for South Africa and to look good in front of the world. They said, we'll release Mandela. That's how he got out of prison. Most people can't tell you how he got out. You put you in a place, in a university where you can learn and study, get at the real stuff, get at the real truth and connect with the real elements, the, the, the frontline elements, the soldiers, women as well as men. You know, and last thing I'll say, I met Muhammad, uh, um, I can't recall his name, Farah Adid. You know who Adid is? He's the one you heard of the film Black Hawk Down, where they show all them, them Africans in Mogadishu, Somalia, attacking US troops. In one day, his troops took out 19 of the most advanced US troops and took down two uh black hawk helicopters no african leader in my lifetime or you or any of us here has done that but he did to run the u.s out because the u.s has not had our interest obama has africom the african troops in almost every african country now this happened under obama so you got to be clear you can't get caught up on just somebody with a black skin it's what's in here what are they about so we met our d we interviewed him I put his, put his interview on the radio here. The FBI went berserk. Did I care? I don't care. You know, I, the important thing is to put the information out there. And that's what I've been about. That's what I've been about. That's what they hate me. The U.S., the government hate me, which is good. That's good that I'm on their hate list. In the 60s, they put me on a thing. They, got a, they, had, they put me in the militant black extremist index. They have indexes they put you in. This is the because they, they got all these secret police, they got cameras everywhere. Now this is the damn police state we live in. And you you gotta wake up to that and you gotta deal. You gotta yes. take care of some business. Like they say in Spanish, tell me who you walk with and I tell you who you are. <laughs> there you go, that's a good one. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I think we're running out of time and you guys, we could be here until midnight, but I do believe that Janelle, as someone mentioned uh, earlier, I think Daniel mentioned earlier, um, a relevant question, a question that we have kind of addressed on this in, in this space is what about civilian review boards? You know, that doesn't necessarily fit into revolution, but it, it does maybe, it, it can maybe um, correct an issue, an immediate issue, right? So what do you all step. think? Mm -hmm. what, do, what do you all think about civilian review boards? Because I know there's been something really recently about uh, LAPD and a real civilian review board, as a and and I think there was a, an article in the paper this morning about Via Nueva uh, talking about their civilian review board not having really any power. But he wasn't complaining about that. He was kind of happy about it. I think. That not you know not having any oversight or anything like that. What do you all think? I think that's a step, an important step. I think another good step is community alert patrol. Bring them back. Yeah. All these urban areas need to have alert patrol. Need to have somebody following the out following the police. And now you got better stuff because you can take a picture with your with your phone. We didn't have all that. We had them old Kodak cameras and you know. Yeah, in fact, one of the organizations that I work with in San Diego, it's called Pillars of the Community, is in, we're in development on a, an app that you can download on your phone that will allow you to report incidents of brutality, it'll allow you to record, it'll, you know, we've got a template, you can tell us a little bit about the incident so that even if people aren't physically there, we get some reporting and information. I think all kinds, as Ron says, all kinds of oversight are important you know we have to use sunlight as a disinfectant and the more scrutiny the police are subject to um, the less able they are to act in the ways they have the other thing you know especially for campus police is we need to talk about disarming the police you know and i'm not saying there's no guns anywhere if somebody runs in and starts shooting the campus up 
but I lived in England. And in England, the cops don't rock around with guns. Now, if somebody has a gun, sure enough, they've managed to find some guns and get some police there with guns. But there's no reason that these police need to be armed the way they are, especially again in schools, on college campuses, in lunchrooms, in all, you know, shopping malls. And the progressive disarming of the security forces is an important step to getting different kinds of mentalities, you know, in those places. You know, one of the things Ron talked about in his school report is, you know, once you arm these school police, they behave differently. Once you create the architecture of incarceration, they behave differently. So I think all of these are important tactics to push for. And we, uh, um, Professor Teixeira, as you said, I think we, we can't get caught in a situation where we say it's all or nothing. You know, most of us are gonna be struggling for reforms for most of our lives, but there's a difference between reforms that the system can concede and keep business as usual and reforms that begin to unblock some of the elements, you know. Um, and, you know, most of us don't know, a lot of us went to LA Unified High Schools and we don't know that up until 1970, the teachers were still hitting the kids, you know. It was a reform to demand an end to, you know, corporal punishment, but it changed the atmosphere. They had to replace those Teachers couldn't hit you. They had to get cops. Well, now we got to get the cops out, you know, so <laughs> robots can hit us or whatever. But all these things, I think, are steps on the path toward uh, freedom and liberation. And, and very good, Daniel, because that, that is true, because every time something changes, it's a financial thing. So when you got campus police, you have to finance that program. Mm -hmm. When they got guns, you, there was more money coming in. And so uh, when everyone talks about reform and the same with local police, when you talk about reform, you're talking about giving up a budget and nobody wants to give up that budget. And so the tough thing to do is defund, but there's got to be some changes. And you're right. I also want to touch on, and you're so right too about the what's going to happen in the future. I, I, I'm a believer that there's going to be uprising. There's going to be a revolutionary war. And I really am concerned about the young people because I grew up in a, in a family, my father was in the military, so guns have always been in the family. But the young people, they're not carrying, they're not, they don't have guns at home. And when things go crazy, I hope their parents or somebody in their family mm -hmm. has protection for them because it may get crazy. And I don't know if it will, but it may. Well, let me just say something about that, which is, you know, General Ziap, who orchestrated two of the greatest defeats of Western armies in the history of military conflicts. He defeated the French at Dim Dim Fu and he defeated the Americans in Tet. He said, you can always find guns. The problem is organizing people. So it's not that I don't disagree with you. I, you know, I agree with you, but I think that the key is People have to have a vision of the society they want to live in, and they have to have clarity about the necessity of being organized to get there. Once that happens, then, you know, no, none of these revolutions, rebellions ever, nobody started out you know, going to Walmart and picking stuff off the shelves. The Cubans didn't have that stuff. The Vietnamese didn't have it. The Salvadorans got their stuff from the Vietnamese. It came on Cuban ships. So, that part is always the last step. The first step is for people like Evelyn and Zorlin to be able to say to people of my generation, Ron's generation, this is what we can take from what you did, but this is where we see the struggle has to go. You know, and, and once then, they have that, we're good. And I, I think you're absolutely right. Every demonstration without exception that I've ever been to one of the chants is the people united will never be defeated. In Spanish, in, uh, in, in, in Farsi, whatever, whatever the issue was, it's always the number one thing is the people have to be united. And you cannot defeat a united people. And that, remember, that's what J. Edgar Hoover said, that the most dangerous thing in America is if blacks get united. That's, that's the danger for us. 
is if blacks get united because we are not going to be able to stop them. And he knew that. That's why he he put so much effort into um, this, this, this organizing these organizations. Let me, let me just say this real quickly too. Uh, in 2007, the US Census Department did a survey, they published a survey. They pointed out that in the, in the continental United States, there are 3,141 counties. A county, of course, very large. 303 of those counties is majority people of color. Who are those people of color? Mostly black and Mexican. Mexican and black people have a beautiful yet hidden history of solidarity. Most people, most Mexicans and most black people do not know that the, the main forces in the Mexican independence struggle against Spain uh, that played a pivotal role uh, were black. They don't know that they're Afro-Mexicans that under Spanish rule, there were 300 years of slavery in Mexico, which began and ended before slavery began and ended in the United States. And that the leaders of the independent struggle after Father Hidalgo fell, uh, who called on people in Mexico to rise up against Spain, he lasted about nine months. And then it was Jose Morelos who took up the leadership of the main Mexican army. He had African roots. He lasted five years before they got him and killed him. And then Vicente Ramon Guerrero, who led the country through to independence, also had African roots. Most people, most Mexican people do not know that history. They don't know that the army in Mexico was referred to as Ejercito Moreno, or the dark army, because the complexion of so many of the fighters was black, that they fought under a black flag. They don't know that. And black, and they and blacks here do not know that thousands of our ancestors who were enslaved escaped south through Texas into Mexico uh, in the 1800s, principally, uh, thousands of us, uh, and were taken in by Mexican people, fed, given jobs, and were not given back to slaveholders. So th this is a history that has to be taught because there's strength in those numbers. When you talk about strength and numbers, and that's why I will, that's my area of specialization. I, I lecture about it. I published about it, trying to help us come together because we could do so much more. If we knew this history between our people, then we would demand better jobs, better houses, more of us go into higher education and so on. And then what group has to get by with less? The white group. And that's why they hide this, in, this, in, this history from us. That is so that's why I'm so determined to put it out there. I even have a children's book in English and Spanish where I put a lot of these elements there in, in the book. And so, mm -hmm. but this is important too for That's us to go forward. That's very true and really important. Um, just last year, I started an organization and it's very small still. Mm -hmm. And it's to fight against police brutality and um, to abolish ICE. Last, just last weekend, we protested at the ICE detention center in Atalanta. Mm -hmm. And it was a small group, but I realized that most of the people who went were black. Okay, it's, there you go. It's really hard to unite Latinos. I don't know what the thing is, but I've been trying to do it for a year now, and honestly, it's so difficult. Do you have any advice on how? <laughs> Try twenty call years. Me. Call me. Be patient. I'll come. I'll, you're not too far away. I'll drive down there. I'll come down there. Yeah, me too. Let them. me know. Give them this history. Give them this history. They all got. You got to give them the history. You know, March 6th just passed, March 6th, 1836. That's when more than 200 uh, slave owners and would-be slave owners were, were taken out by Mexican forces at the Alamo. Mm -hmm. They need to know, and Black people should have been, that should be a big holiday for Black people. Mm -hmm. And we should be embracing your people for defeating, under Santa Ana, defeating uh, Jim Bowie and uh, Davy Crockett and all them people who were slave owners and mercenaries. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but because we don't know history, we don't, we're not motivated to do anything. You see, June 25th, 1876, that's when uh, Chief Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull wiped out Custer and the 7th Cavalry. You know, I celebrated, I'd be by myself <laughs> sitting in here celebrating, but you gotta, you gotta get people on board. So much you know, Afro Latino uh, history when I travel down south of the border. You can go to just about any uh, major city and you will find the African-American Museum. 
And that's mm -hmm. for a reason. That's because we were there and we were there as slaves. And then as we, as we some of us stayed and, and there was, there's a big uh, group of us. Yeah, especially um, in Quahini Quilapa, the in Guerrero, it's a yeah. museum. Yes, I have many Afro-Mexican friends. Yes. Yeah. I've taken students to Afro-Mexico, mostly in the Costa Chica, there in Guerrero and Oaxaca, mm -hmm. uh, so, aside so, from Veracruz. Uh -huh. so, with, so with that, we need to wrap it up. And I uh, pre appreciate you two being here. Ron and Daniel, wonderful information. I mean, so much history. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, Zora Lynn, go ahead and close us out. However you yeah, want to do. I just, I just Thanks want to for take having us. Thank you honor, all. honor to both of you guys for not only showing up and teaching us and giving us so much wisdom, but I want to honor you, Daniel, for dedicating your life to teaching young kids um, history about what, you know, everything that's going on. And Ron, I want to honor you, especially for everything that you've done, uh, your commitment to the Black Power Movement and your commitment to the people. Um, I want to give honor to everyone that showed up here today and um, that are obviously here for change and are interested in something much bigger than just, you know, the conversation, but the real action in the streets. So we want to thank you for um, attending another installment of our conversations on race and policing. I want to give honor again to you two for showing up and of course showing out. Um, so thank you everyone for thank attending you. your great thank questions you. and um, everything.